Hey, it's Storyworthy. Today on the show, journalist Brian Karam talks about just getting back from Ukraine. What I came away with more than anything else, and I remember just sitting in a, in a restaurant in Lviv, like my fourth day there, and it was quite obvious to me that there's no way in hell Vladimir Putin can win. There isn't. He can't conquer that country. He can only level it, and he's doing his level best to do it. He's out of touch. The soldiers who have been captured or killed are not that well trained. The Ukrainian people have grown to be an independent nation in the last 30 years and don't want to become a, a member state of a new Soviet Union. Today on the show, journalist and White House correspondent Brian Karam talks about just getting back from Ukraine. Stay close. Hey, it's Brian Karam and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show of almost 12 years or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the show last week, which was Story Smash, the storytelling game show. Yes, that's right. I put that up last week because if you may remember, last week was Passover and Easter and all these holidays. And although usually I put up Story Smash as a bonus episode, I put it up on Tuesday, and I do hope you guys had a chance to listen to it, because I got to say, man, that show gets funnier and funnier, and we're having such a good time playing it. I know it comes across when you listen to it. So go back, you guys, listen to Story Smash, but not today. Stick with me today, because right now I have a very interesting person on my podcast. He is journalist and White House correspondent Brian Karam, and he brings forth the topic, I just got back from Ukraine. So... You know, and I know, this is going to be a great conversation. I have to say, when the war started back in February, I I got an idea from Airbnb. Somebody had posted about, you know, renting an Airbnb, you know, a condo or an apartment for the weekend from someone who lives in Ukraine so that you can actually just put money in their pockets directly. So I rented an apartment in Kiev for three days. It was only like $85.00. But uh, the owner really appreciated it, and she wrote to me and, you know, thanked me and uh, told me about her situation, uh, her and a friend taking children and getting over to Poland, then getting a car and driving to Portugal where they have some time to, uh, to, you know, stay away from the war. And she wrote to me, you know, our men are fighting in Ukraine and we are here You know, we don't know what's next, and it's just devastating. But I was happy to do at least, you know, a little bit. I felt like I helped out a tiny bit. I do recommend you guys do that if you haven't already or if you want to help Ukraine. This whole Airbnb thing is a good idea. You don't go to the city, obviously. You're never going on this trip. That's not the point. Anyway, uh, so that's been going on. And, you know, every story is just so dramatic and every story is so crushing. I I think the reason why um, it's so blatant that the war was unwarranted, Mm -hmm. so blatantly obvious that uh, Vladimir Putin is a is a Trump like bully with more power. And it's so blatantly obvious that um, that these people are merely trying to defend their home, which is what any of us would do. So when there were two galvanizing moments, I think, in this war. First of all, having been there and having just got back, I can tell you without a doubt, there's no way that that Vladimir Putin can conquer the country. They won't let that happen. He can really level it. Um, and he has the weaponry to do that, but he'll never win the hearts and minds of the people there. There are posters all over the country in Ukrainian and in Russian that say, this is our ground. We live on it. You're going to live beneath it. There are tales of farmers, uh, you know, hijacking Russian vehicles and taking them. These are a very salty people. I, I met a farmer probably 40 miles southwest of uh, Kiev who said, I hear Americans have a lot of guns. Bring them over here and we'll kill a lot of Russian bears. These are people who just aren't going to go gentle into that good night. Putin can can conquer them. And it boils down to two things. Um the president of Ukraine said uh, 
you know, when offered a, a way to leave by the U.S., he said, I don't need a ride. I need weapons. And that won over the hearts and minds, that simple statement of I'm defending my home. I will stay one over a lot of people, including a lot of Trumpers uh, who, you know, before would not have supported it because they sided with Trump now see it as what it was. And when Biden said, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power, that won over a lot of people who said, yes, you're you're acknowledging the obvious. Thank you. Let me ask you something, at least in terms of like Biden, you know, at least we have a president that to me, at least he's like speaking plainly. And I appreciate that. Am I right? He's been better than his communication staff. I find them to be uh, aloof, uh, elitist, entitled and too young. Wow. Wow. Those are big words, man. I mean, I know you have extensive experience as a journalist in the White House. I mean, I know that you were one of the first people after the, the war in Kuwait to be over there uh, with, you know, you saw what was going on. You've traveled all over the world. I understand you've been in like 10 different war zones. And, uh, you know, you just seem really seem to have your pulse on what is going on. You've written a lot of books. You can tell by your body of work, you've done an awful lot. So I'm just saying I'm impressed with how much you've accomplished and words coming from you are a big deal. That's all I'm saying. Let me just tell people a little bit about some of your experience, Brian. You have a podcast on right now called Just Ask the Question. I have to tell you, I've been listening to Just Ask the Question, and it, it's just a great show. You have on some fantastic guests, including recently you've had on Mary Trump. And then I heard you on her show as well. And she seems like a normal person. She is very normal. I, I consider her a good friend. I, it's kind of like my little sister. Yeah, that's really sweet. I enjoy hearing you guys banter back and forth. You sound very close. You've also written a lot of books, including Warning Signs, a guidebook for parents on how to read the early signs of low self-esteem, addiction, and hidden violence in your kid, co-authored with John Kelly. You do have three kids, right? Three. I'll, and I'll die a happy man if I figure out how they got the footprints on the ceiling. But other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> And now you have another book called Free the Press, Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. When did you write that book? Well, it's been out for about six weeks. Oh, it's brand new. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. But when did you start actually writing that book? Well, it's been something that's been going through my mind since I first joined uh, the ranks of reporters because I got in in the 80s um, when the death began. I mean, it was a slow death as we were strangled. Uh, and as uh, big business overcame, uh, journalism and independence died. And, you know, when I got into the business, 80% of what you see, read, or hear was um, engineered by maybe two dozen companies, maybe five or six companies control more than 90% of what you see, read, or hear. Wow. That's frightening. And it's, and, and, and it's telling that every place I've ever worked has either been bought out sold, closed, or merged, uh, including the latest place, the last independent um, journalism operation on the planet large was Playboy magazine, and they uh, shuttered their doors. I was the last man standing covering the White House for Playboy, the last one uh, writing editorial content for that magazine, which folded, and now they, they're merely an online marketing tool to sell uh women's underwear, sex toys, and meat accessories. Sure, 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 sure. I'm, I'm only asking you because, I mean, I think it's very interesting that you were the correspondent for Playboy when you worked at the White House. So, like, I mean, okay, usually I have comedians on the show here, and we, we don't have this kind of conversation, so I, I'm just not familiar. Okay, let's say you're invited to the White House to a press conference, and you are representing Playboy. Now, this has nothing to do with the sexy pictures and stuff, right? No. Excuse people gave for buying the magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was getting into. Uh, as a member of the press, and look, you, you look at Playboy, and it had a very good history of, of really good journalism and good <laughs> fiction writing. Um, you're a member of the press. I've been a member of the press since 1980-something, and uh, as long as you hold a press pass, they can't invite you they 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 have to let you in uh now whether or not they give you a day pass to enter or they give you a hard pass which allows you to enter whenever you want that's about and and it's a secret service that draws that delineation in fact that was the fight that i got into uh with 
uh, Trump when I uh, he tried to take away my press pass because he didn't like me asking questions, particularly of uh, wasn't even him. It was uh, the the big, tall, fat guy who was uh, I forget his name, but he he, uh, he, he was a guy who sells fish oil now on uh, TV. And wait, was that Sebastian Gorka? Yeah, uh, that yeah. guy. Yeah, I, he, he wasn't a member of the press. He wasn't a member of the administration that day either. But they tried to yank my press pass because I told him we could talk there or go outside and talk all day long. And they didn't like that. And so uh, I had my press pass pulled. I sued. I kept it um, and I beat him in court three times. Yeah, that is so exciting that you hung in there. And every time they tried to get you, they lost. You won every time. I told him to get a job, actually. And then. Two or three days later, he was on TV selling fish oil. And somebody said, do I have a comment? And I said, well, I, I told him to get a job. I guess he took my advice. Okay, so what happened was Sebastian Gorka, okay, he thinks he's like a talk show host. So he calls you guys a group of de- people eager for demonic possession. I said they look I I did my Rodney Dangerfield voice and I had asked uh, Trump to stick around and take some questions from the press. And someone in the crowd said, oh, he's already talked to the real press. Why don't you whine a little bit? And I I said, oh, look at this crowd. They look eager for demonic possession. <laughs> and it got a laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. You know, and, and then Gorka took it, you know, the wrong way or took it the way he wanted to take it. And then you. You're on the lawn and he yells at you. He's like, oh, and you're a journalist, right? And then you say to him, come over here and talk to me, brother. We can go outside and have a long conversation. Yeah. And then he yells at you. You're not a journalist. You're a punk. Yeah. And he said that in front of everybody. Yeah. And I'm the one I had my press pass yanked. He didn't walk any closer to me, though. I noticed that. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. (laughs) So then when you go to court because they're trying to pull your press pass, and you're like, no way, you're not taking my press pass. And then, like, what did they say? Was it fast? Well, I the yeah, the, well, the White House tried to make the point that um, if they didn't keep me under control, that there'd be, uh, you know, what's to keep reporters from running around and mooning the president? And the uh, uh, <laughs> the judge said, there's there's plenty of legislation available for that. I I don't foresee a a, a bunch of rogue mooning exactly. reporters in the White House. Unbelievable. They quickly <laughs> found in my favor and he appealed it. And the appeals court, the appeal judge quickly found in my favor. Then they put it before the entire appeals court. The last uh, step before um, taking it to the Supreme Court and they lost there as well. Um, as one of the judges said, this is clearly just them not liking my speech. There was was nothing involved other than free speech. This is very epitome of free speech. Exactly. So, uh, they, uh, they, they found in my favor and then he sat on it for a while and then he got involved in the insurrection and I guess forgot about it. And after, uh, after he left office, uh, the Biden administration quietly dropped it. I, I'm telling you, all those people that were in the White House, like when you saw Sarah Sanders and Kellyanne Conway, were you just like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> no, I knew what was going on. It was bullshit. The first day in the White House, when they first walked in, Kellyanne walked up to me and she goes, gosh, you you look familiar. I said, yes, we were on several television shows together in Philadelphia several years ago. And she goes, we dated And I go, no, Kellyanne, we were on TV shows together. I assure (laughs) you, had we dated, (laughs) you would have remembered that. That is hilarious. She was uh, she was interesting. The whole crew of them were interesting. The the idea of alternative facts and the uh, idea of uh, uh, it was just bombast. But the one thing that Trump did well that Biden doesn't do well is dominate the headlines. Hmm. Um, Trump who loved to speak and would love to berate people, but he'd still put himself out there to get it done. Biden is more about the actions speaking louder than words. And unfortunately for Biden, it has hurt him because his actions, while many of them are admirable. In fact, he's done more for rural America with the infrastructure bill than in one year than yeah. Trump or any other president has done in the last 20. Yeah. And I would have ridden that into the midterms, but, He's been overcome by other things and they don't it's it's like they forgot that they did this great thing. And uh, because he doesn't take up as much, use as much oxygen on the airways as Trump, 
that still leaves plenty of room for Trump and his minions to be on the airwaves, sucking up all the remainder uh, oxygen. And that hurts. That hurts Biden. And they don't get that. They don't understand that. I mean, I guess it's just like, okay, they're the ones trying to be the politicians they always have. Right. I mean, in other words, Trump is the one who changed everything. Trump was a symptom. Trump was not the cause. Trump was a system uh uh, was uh, well was a symptom of what has occurred and su- and has caused us to suffer uh, for years. And he was, you know, that it, you, I think it started back uh, with Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a problem beginning with Ronald Reagan, and I think it was a problem that was exacerbated with uh, others that were in Congress. And I think that that's been a problem for years. And so Donald Trump played to that. Ronald Reagan set the table. Donald Trump sat at the table. Wait, what is going on back there? Are you getting a fax? It sounded like a go. fax that's, machine. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. And I forgot Newt Gingrich. I mean, yeah. he was the one who created a lot of division in Congress. And it was uh, because of that that we're so divisive today. Mm-hmm. And so what Donald Trump did, he's a grifter. He's a con artist. He took advantage of the situation, but he didn't create the situation. No, no, I know that. I understand that. But my question is, what do you want Biden to do differently? I think he's fine doing what he's doing. I think it's his uh, support staff. One of the things that uh, and he needs to have a few more press conferences. He's had one Mm -hmm. and and, uh, Trump had more than that. But his uh, his staff need to go out on TV, be on the North Lawn, answer questions to reporters all the things that they don't do that Trump did do. And the thing is, is that Biden's people have much more to sell and and actually have, you know, facts. Right, right, right. OK, legitimately, like bringing legitimate things to the table. Right, right, right. So, Brian, is this a common theory with your friends or like a common sentiment? Oh, I think there are a lot of reporters that think that there's something wrong. And then there's a lot of reporters who think that there's a lot right. There are a lot of port- reporters who have access who think, ah, it's fine. But there are many more that don't that that need it. And there are many. And I, I, you know, I haven't polled anybody. I can. I'm just the canary in the coal mine. I'll tell you when it's wrong. And I don't give a shit, you know, who it is that we're talking about. Yeah. Because <laughs> the bottom line is, I, I, you know, it is the president's staff and the president's duty to put his best foot forward. And mm-hmm. God bless him for that. Mazel tov. Let him do it. It's my job to hold their feet to the fire and make them accountable to the American people to make sure that what they say they're doing, they're actually doing. Now, every president deserves criticism, but every president doesn't warrant the level of criticism that Trump warrants, because not every president is a traitor to the American Republic. And Trump is his bullshit needs to be called out blatantly, loudly and often. What Biden needs to be called out on is why doesn't he have someone with any experience who knows how to communicate on his staff communicating what it is he's doing? I find little wrong with what he does. I find a lot wrong with how his administration communicates to the American people. And that's reflected in his, uh, you know, in his polling numbers, his low polling numbers. He should be polling much greater than he's polling now. Yeah, I think so as well. Meanwhile, you've got Trump and his minions going off about, you know, terror at the border, uh, inflation and not ever. There's no one explaining the fact that the look, we've had problems on the border since the mid 70s. This isn't news. Right. This is ongoing. And right. every president has kicked the can down the the, the hall and, and kept away from dealing with it. The last time anyone tried to deal with it was the was the Bush Reagan era. When they offered pathways to citizenship, and these were Republicans, by the way. The DREAM Act, right? Wasn't that it, the DREAM Act? Uh, well, the DREAM Act is actually from the Obama. Yeah, that's one of the things that people have been here and dream of. Yeah, that, that has, is the Obama era stuff, but and it has roots in Clinton. But the, um, it, the idea that there's panic and terror and chaos at the border is garbage. And the idea that, you know, inflation is run away, we're all going to die soon, you know, ah, you know, is, is garbage. And, you know, you have people that are at work and the economy is is much more complicated than Republicans would have you believe. But they're able to sell this garbage because there's no one on the other side fighting back. And that's, you know, I, I it's not my job to fight back for the president, but I will tell them that they're idiots for not doing it. 
And I'll tell the American people, you, you're being sold. You're still being sold a pig in a poke. There's still a problem. And, and the problem is that there is all this bandwidth being taken by Trump and his minions trying to sell you garbage that isn't real. And people are buying it. And that's why the, the polling numbers are low for the president. I got to tell you, man, it's like nobody in my world ever knew anything about politics. And now all of a sudden we all have to pay attention. Well, you you did. But I think I think the American people look, most people want to go to work and uh, get their kids to soccer practice and lead their life and not yes. worry about politics. Right. But there are ways that you are drawn into politics when it affects you like uh, you know, like medical insurance, health insurance, sure. or even more importantly, why is that pothole not been, you know, filled? Why is that stoplight not working? Those things, there are, there are ways that people get drawn into politics, but never as dramatically as, you know, as during the Trump era, because until Donald Trump, we never had a traitor as president. I know. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I can't believe what we've lived through. I mean, I just think in our lifetime, what we've seen, you know, the moon landing and then Nixon and then 9-11 and, and, and then the, you know, the, the insurrection. And now we're looking down the barrel of World War Three. Are we not? We're already in World War Three. Yeah. We've seen a lot. But how about my parents? They, <laughs> they saw World War Two and the Great Depression. <laughs> I know. And I saw on television. And radio, like the, our cell phones have more technology than when they sent a man to the moon. There's more computing power on my telephone than was on the lunar module in 1969. Absolutely. Yeah. I could fly the lunar module with my with a couple of apps on my cell phone. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get over to your story in just a second. But before we do, I did want to mention that you are from Kentucky, but you don't have the accent at all. Do it if you won't. Put your paints on. I go, how many coats of paint would you like me to put on there, mom? Oh, that's so funny. That's hilarious. That is so, so funny. Let me ask you, like, how did you decide to spend your days and nights thinking about politics? You could have been in any other kind of journalism. You could have been in sports journalism. Did that. Oh, you did sports journalism. Done sport. I've covered everything. I, I grew up reading what I consider one of the best newspapers ever produced, and that was the Courier Journal and Louisville Times when the Bingham family owned it. I worked there, uh, unfortunately, not not long enough, but uh, I worked there in in the 80s. And there was a there was a above the elevator doors going into the newsroom was a saying by Robert Worth Bingham, who had bought the papers in like 1918. And it said, I've always regarded the newspapers owned by me as a public trust and have endeavored to so to conduct them as to render the greatest public service. And. All the progress. I mean, they were fighting for Planned Parenthood in the 1930s. People who were enlightened and progressive and pro-education. So I grew up reading that newspaper and thinking, man, I really I wanted to travel around the world on somebody else's nickel. (laughs) I like writing. And so I figured, man, journalism, that's that's it. And I grew up in a political family. In fact, uh, the very first politician I ever interviewed outside of my family was a man who had worked with my family and whom they despised, and that was Mitch McConnell. <laughs> oh, my gosh, you're kidding. In 1978, he was the county executive in Jefferson County, Kentucky. He was a moderate who had a civil rights panel, a women's rights panel, uh, an immigration panel. And <clears throat> I, the night before I went in to interview him, I talked to my uncle uh, Pete, and I said, uh, you got to kind of school me up on this guy. What's he What's he like? And he says, well, Brian, it's really easy to figure out Mitch McConnell. I said, yeah. And he goes, Mitch McConnell's about one thing. And I said, what's that? And he goes, Mitch McConnell. That mm-hmm. was 1978. and It hasn't changed. The rest of the world has yet to embrace or learn what my uncle learned in the early 70s. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And Mitch McConnell was probably like 60 then. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was 140 back then. Yeah, no kidding. He still looked like a turtle. All right, we're going to get over to your story in just a second. But before we do, I wanted to ask you one more question. Now, I know that while you were covering the war on drugs, you were the first journalist to cover and be at Pablo Escobar's palatial prison after he escaped from the Colombian authorities. So what is a palatial prison like? (laughs) A palace. He had an office. He had sleeping arrangements. He had cottages. He had a uh, he had one 
building that was just for his paramours and it had porn and it looked like something out of the playboy mansion you know like a circular bed and and he had there were gun turrets but they all pointed out they weren't pointed in and he had uh motorcycles and a soccer field by the way the soccer field that i walked on there were buried bodies underneath uh oh there was God. there was a forest to do his walking there was an office there was palate i mean beautiful view o- over uh, uh medellin and over uh, uh the city that um in Vigado, where the prison was hmm. and uh when the heat got too hot for him and they were talking about putting him in a real prison he had a he paid off a guard and uh he there was one cottage that was up against one of the fences that had a secret escape route and he took off into the jungle and off he off he ran wow that must have been really fascinating i mean it must have been such a juicy story to cover like how did, how did you get that position or that that story i'm better than everybody else yeah you've been there longer i had good sources uh, i'll put it that way i had some good sources that got me down there yeah. Uh, and that helped. Now, the second guy in, I, I think I beat him by a couple of days, uh, was, was my mentor in the business. And one of my uh, and he's this Friday, he'll be well, it's uh, it'll be April 29th. Uh, I know we're recording this all air afterwards, but um, uh, he and I and Jim Acosta are going to be talking about the White House press and how to change it at, at the <clears throat> at the uh, press club. National Press Club, and that would be Sam Donaldson. Oh, that's so great. I love Sam Donaldson. Sam was, uh, Sam was, what was funny is we both shot a stand up in the same location, uh, standing at, uh, um, <laughs> at, at Pablo Escobar's desk and, and then pointing at the wonderful view he had of, of Medellin. It was, it's kind of funny that we both chose the same stand up. You know, that, there was a good reason to do it. I mean, this is supposed to be prison. It looked like he was the CEO of a, a pleasure cruise company, <laughs> but everybody was so happy in Columbia to get him off the streets because he had threatened so many people that they were willing to put him in that prison just to have him off the streets. He had killed so many people and you know, blown it. Hell, he blew up an airplane because he didn't like somebody. I, yay. Which airplane was that? Uh, that was, um, 1982 or 83 air beyond yeah. the flight. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. It's so interesting. Oh, my God, Brian, you are so interesting. I could talk to you forever. We won't even cover my stand-up comedy. Yeah, I know, right? And you're also in a band, the Rhythm Bandits Band. What do you play, bass? No, I'm the lead singer, baby. What kind of music do you play? First in originals, yep. Oh, fun, fun. What's your favorite cover tunes? Oh, God, anything that'll get people dancing, it's high energy. Oh, fun. Doing Green Day the other day. I like them a lot, but I'll do, you know, Buddy Holly and the Beatles and the Stones. Well, it's it's just a great way to get your artistic energy out, you know, in a band like people like Stephen King and Dave Barry, even Kevin Bacon. You know, they're all in, in bands. Keeps me sane. Well, I'm glad. All right, you guys, before we get over to Brian's story, I wanted to remind you that we are playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show every month at the Hollywood Improv. Head over to StorySmashShow.com and you'll find out when the next date is and you can get your tickets. And don't forget to listen to Story Smash here on StoryWorthy. That's awfully fun. And also follow Story Smash on Instagram at Story Smash because that's where I put all the good photos. Yeah. All right, you guys, he's here right now. You've heard him talking. He is a White House correspondent and a journalist and an author. He's also an analyst for CNN. He's done so many things. He's had several books out. And right now he has a podcast, like I said, called Just Ask the Question. Just Ask the Question. It's very entertaining. And uh, I had a, a confidential source in a murder case in, in, in San Antonio in uh, 1989 and 1990. And I wouldn't give up the confidential source. And so I went to jail four times and that case went to the Supreme Court. And uh, <clears throat> when I did get out, they, yeah. The, the the they uh the national press club had to give me something <laughs> so they, they, i guess <laughs> coming up to go to jail four times they they gave me a medal of valor and what jail was that is it the same jail over and over yep it was a uh, same jail in fact where the guy was that was accused of murdering the cop that i had done the story on and that was about two hispanic kids who had been caught on the they were on the 
wrong end of town uh, after the right hours. And they were pulled over by a cop and there was a struggle that ensued. And the cop got shot by one of the kids and um, with his own service revolver. The kids, of course, said that they were being beaten and roughed up and uh, no one believed them because they were two Hispanic kids. And one of them had 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 been in trouble with the law before. Um, But as it turned out, the cop was uh, speedballing and on drugs when he had started the fight with the kids. And perhaps they were telling the truth. So I had all that information and protected the source who gave me information. And and that allowed me to interview uh, um, Henry David uh, Hernandez, who was accused of the murder. And he confessed to it, but said that the cop was acting oddly at the time of his death. And of course, when the autopsy report came out and proved that he was perhaps correct, Nobody cared. They just went after the reporter for getting it from getting the exclusive interview. And that's how come I ended up in jail. And it was really kind of funny. I was sitting on the uh, I was sitting on the you know on, on the stand at one point in time testifying. And his own defense attorney said, well, how did you get this information? And I said, well, why talk to me? Why don't you talk to your own client? He knows better than I do. And, and he goes, you don't get to ask questions here. I'm the attorney. And the judge said, you know, normally I'd say that's right, but that's a pretty good question. You want to answer <laughs> and, and they wouldn't answer it. And and the judge said he, he liked my pluck, but still I'm out of luck. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you guys did you like get to know the guys in jail? They're like, hey, Brian, what's going on? You know, what was funny is uh, nobody likes a snitch. And so when people found out that I went to jail for not snitching, I had a lot of people that were very friendly to me, and <laughs> including when I got out, G. Gordon Liddy, who had gone to jail for something like that. So I was on Liddy's show quite a bit when he had a radio show. And in fact, I, I read the closing uh, um, <laughs> limerick about him uh, in, on his the fifth anniversary of his radio show where, where I made fun of him pointedly and he kind of liked it. But Oh, that's so funny. That is awesome. All right, you guys, you can find Brian over on Twitter at Brian Karam. And of course, find me over there as well at Storyworthy. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the very talented and interesting Brian Karam. All right. So the story was uh, when the war broke out, in Ukraine, I was very interested in seeing it firsthand. I had been to uh, 10 or 11 conflict zones in the past. This would have been about my my 12th visit to a conflict zone. Um, there was a lot of crap that was being said about what was going on, including some of the um, Congress, even to this day, Rand Paul saying, you know, they once were part of Russia, so they have a right to do it. Well, he's a Russian stooge, and uh, McCain was right about him. But before that, I wanted to be able to point to facts and say you're full of shit and know what I was talking about and not having heard it secondhand. So I uh, got together a a crew. We went to Ukraine. I was there for about 10 days. We visited Lviv and the countryside. We didn't get to Kiev because at the time it was under siege. We got about 40 miles away and got shelled pretty good. Um, And that's when I ran into a farmer who said, you know, uh, I hear you have a lot of guns in America. If you bring them over here, we'll kill a lot of Russian bear. Um, It was nightly. It was you would get 35, 40 minutes sleep before the air raid sirens went off. There were, uh, you know, air raids and there were uh, rockets that, you know, landed not too far from where we were. But what I came away with more than anything else, and I remember just sitting in a, in a restaurant in Lviv, like my fourth day there, and it was quite obvious to me that there's no way in hell Vladimir Putin can win. There isn't. He can't conquer that country. He can only level it, and he's doing his level best to do it. He's out of touch. The soldiers who have been captured or killed by Russia are not that well trained. The Ukrainian people have grown to be an independent nation in the last 30 years and don't want to become a a member state of a new Soviet Union. Wait a second. Wait a second. Back up. Let me ask you a question. Do you mean that the soldiers that the Ukrainians captured, the Russian soldiers, they're confused? Some of them walked into battle in their battle dress. They thought they were going for a parade. There were those that have been there was a story that I confirmed of, you know, and they're also just not well trained. I mean, one story I confirmed was in uh, uh, the Donetsk region. There was a, a you know, the, 
the Russian soldiers were taking to tender, trying to hook up with young uh, Ukrainian girls. And in one case, a couple of Ukrainian girls uh, suckered about half a dozen Russians into a uh, a neighborhood and then uh, peltered their armored personnel carrier with Molotov cocktails, killing them all. This is, like I said, these are very salty people. Um, I interviewed a family that had left Mariupol and uh, that was very sad. They had been in a, um, they lived right across the street from the theater that had been clearly marked children and was bombed by Russia there. They talked about how their apartment was leveled by artillery from the top floor down to the bottom floor. And they lived in a communal bomb shelter and would come out during the day to bury their neighbors in their front yard. So people would know who the dead were and they managed to escape. Then there was another family I ran into. Wait, wait, wait. Can I ask you real quick under that huge theater? It was marked children. Like I know you could see it from the air. You see it from satellite photos. Yeah. You could see it from space. And there was a bomb shelter under that. Uh, Well, the bomb shelter I'm talking about was across from that. There was shelter in place for the children in that. That was a it was a shelter for children. Did anyone in the theater survive like or if they were in the bomb shelter portion of it? Do they know how many people died in the theater? We'll never know how many people. I don't think we'll ever accurately how many people died and how many people got away. Um, But yes, there were plenty that died. And of course, there were some that got out. So sad. Um, But the most interesting encounter i had with with uh displaced you know with the refugees was in a place called the new hope mission in lviv and i saw this three-year-old kid his name was benjamin didn't speak a word of english but his parent his mother and his grandmother did the father was still in the donetsk region they were in eastern ukraine he he was still fighting and they had taken a week to get to this shelter and i saw him and he had this little pained look on his face. He looked very sad. And I, I, so I started playing peekaboo with him just to see if I could get him engaged. And he started smiling and he started playing peekaboo back. And, and then he stopped and he got a very sad look on his face and he turned and he said something to his mother. And I said, what did he say? And she goes, well, he wonders since he's having a good time again, does that mean that the planes are going to fly overhead and start dropping bombs again? Oh, is so sad what this three-year-old kid every good memory he had was tied to death and destruction wow that is really sad man oh i was in tears i lost it and i've that's really you know i've told that alex venman was on my uh, uh podcast uh this week and we spoke about that and i i'll never i'll never forget that i i mean i i and it so it you're looking at a war that was totally unnecessary for reasons that are totally personal. And it has nothing to do with making the world better. It only has to do with assuaging the ego of a maniacal narcissist. And that's in this little three-year-old boy who has no ties to any of it. He's just begun his life. He that's his footing. That's what he has to go forward from. And we in this country are so incredibly spoiled and we don't realize how good we have it. We fight with each other over the most trivial things, uh, over the most stupid things. And there are people that are lucky on any given day to still draw breath. And that little three-year-old kid just brought it all, all home for me. Yeah, yeah, very, very sobering. Yeah, it was. I think about the people in our country, and we're, we're fighting over facts. We're fighting over fiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, the problem is in this country, we don't even know what a fact is anymore. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, but, and and you know the the, the stuff that we've. I mean, we're we're worried about the 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 sexual characteristics of cartoon characters that's you know we're fighting disney i know everything is crazy in florida no. let me tell you stick <laughs> fuck is that all about everything is crazy in florida let me ask you something why did you go to ukraine this time i mean like were you with cnn or were you by yourself uh i went i write a column for a salon.com and wrote four or five columns about it while i was there um i took with me a camera crew so we could shoot a uh a uh uh a documentary that we've done. I'll go back and finish it up probably in May. Um, so that's 
and then we'll see where it goes from there. Well, how are you getting into the country? Do you fly into Kiev? No, you fly into Poland, Warsaw, and drive from Warsaw into Kiev. And there are fixers I have on the ground who help me get from one place to the other. Uh, it's 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 a it, it's a proposition, and it's uh, it it's a tough one, but you got to do it, so you do it. And <clears throat> having been in conflict zones before, you know, I know you know how to duck and win. <laughs> so that's, Gosh, I am so <laughs> impressed. I have never met anybody like you. Okay, let me ask you, how is that Alex Vindman guy? I love him. Well, he's doing great. Um, he's uh, uh, giving advice to the government now on the war in Ukraine. He stood up for the right things when he was, you know, and if you go back, he was he testified against Trump during the first impeachment, which was about Ukraine. Well, yeah, I mean, no. Yeah, well, obviously, he ha- probably has valuable information about Ukraine, and I think he speaks the language as well. Yeah, yeah, he has relatives that are from there. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I guess what I'm saying is that Alex Vindman, I mean, he's like he's almost like a Zelensky. He became like beloved overnight. I mean, it seemed. And he told such a personal story about his father and how how he could tell his father that he knew he did the right thing, that he was honest and he was truthful. I just love that man, Alex Vindman. Oh, I love him. Well, he I I I, I like his um I really ad- admire his stance, and I really think that he's a man of character, and there are very few of those left on the planet. And it's always nice when you run into a couple of them. Well, you're one of them as well, Brian Karam, and I so appreciate you doing the show today, coming on to Storyworthy, and I know my audience is going to just love you, and I highly recommend you guys check out all things Brian Karam. There's a lot of things to check out, including the podcast, Just Ask the Question, and uh, also don't forget to check out his new Amazon Prime documentary called Six Feet Apart, which is about the beginning of the pandemic, right? Well, and I start in L.A. I'd gone out for my son's uh a merit wedding that got yeah. canceled because they had stopped. That was when they shut down the country. So it, it's a it's a week in the life of the United States as I drove across country from because they had shut down flights. I had driven across country from L.A. back to D.C. So it starts in the White House uh, with me questioning Trump. I go to L.A. and then it ends up at the end after I go across country with me back in the White House, pissing off Trump once again. In that week, the United States went from one of the smaller, for him having almost no uh, COVID to leading the world in uh, the outbreak of COVID. And it charts in real time as I go across. And I was there in Vegas when it was closed down. I had, I had never so, yeah, I've been three county fairs and a goat fucking, and I ain't never seen nothing like that. That's, I mean, they, were the lights off? Everything, yeah, it, the lights were off. The streets were empty. I thought I was in a ghost town. I got so sick of fast food in, in my travel across the country. I even, I said, you know, in case of a, a, a nuclear war, three things will survive: cockroaches, McDonald's. And Keith Richards and the rest of us. Well, why, why aren't you eating in like little cafes like mom and pop diners? It's got to be better. I couldn't find that. any. Really? I mean, I drove across country and I tried to find places that were, you know, mom and pop cafes. Couldn't find any that were open on the interstate. It was it was an interesting 10 days total time. And and, and it's, you know, it, it's a road trip. <laughs> it's a road trip. And one more question. Did your son get married? Yes, he got married, uh, and he, I have a, a grandson. Oh, yay! <laughs> and so it's it was a uh, it, it was an interesting, like I said, very. He didn't. They shut down everything, so we had all these elaborate plans that they shut down. So he ended up renting a Frank Sinatra's <laughs> one of his homes in uh, Palm Springs <laughs> in, in Woodland Hills or Toluca. Well, oh, Calabasas or something. Or maybe they were out in Rancho Cucamonga. Who knows? <laughs> or Canoga Park. <laughs> I don't know yeah. where it was. But Rancho Cucamonga. 
Cucamonga. <laughs> and so there was like 10 people in, in attendance, um, several hundred. But Well, man, you've had a great life and you've done so much so far. You still have so much to do. I really admire you. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope I'm, I, it's, I hope I got a lot of miles left in me. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had Jackie Martling on my show. Yeah, you did too. He was on my yeah. show too. I love Jackie. He told the story about hanging out with Rodney Dangerfield in Vegas. You got to listen to that episode. It's really fun. Funny. Well, there's so many stories with with Rodney. And mm-hmm. one of my favorite is a friend of mine was a comedian, uh, is a comedian. And he he had done he was doing a Caroline's, I think. And so he walked in. He'd never done it before. And the, he says, hey, where's the green room for comedians? And so he goes, it's that door over there. So he walks out the door. He finds himself in an alley. <laughs> and, then, and in the alley is a guy with his hand up against the wall taking a piss <laughs> and he, he goes, Rodney, is that you? And Rodney turned around and says, grabbing his junk and said, Hey, welcome to the big time. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Jackie Martling story. It's similar. The story is similar because Rodney Dangerfield uh, and, and Jackie took a piss on a billboard in Vegas. Yeah. Amazing. He was, you know, oh, that's an ugly hat, but it looks good on you. <laughs> so one day Donald Trump, when he first got in office, would not talk to the press as he left the Oval Office to go to the airplane. So we're all sitting out there shouting out questions. He's waving and ignoring us. And I looked at him and he had on the black suit, the red tie. His hair was blowing in the wind for everything in the world. He looked like Rodney. As he's ignoring us, I go, hey, a tough room. How you doing? <laughs> and he turns around <laughs> and, goes, and he walked over and took our questions. And after that, chopper talk was started. He felt comfortable talking with us as he left based on that one incident. And then I routinely would have to, you know, I only got called in the Oval once or twice during his uh, administration once Bill Shine wanted me to do Rodney for him. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he liked Rodney. I'm telling uh-huh. you. So it was, uh, and you know, and then I did Sean Connery for him too. And so he liked that. So that was, yeah, it was a, a, an odd time with an odd president. You know, I got to say the craziest, like, did you ever sit around with people and talk about the craziest things Trump did? Like for me, it was when he, he, well, he did so many things, but this one time he goes over to visit the prime minister of Japan and they're walking over this little bridge to feed the koi fish below. Right. And they give Trump like a little porcelain bowl. It's very special. And he's got like this little bit of food in there and they're all supposed to just sprinkle the food over, you know, the bridge to the, to the fish and Trump gets to the middle of the bridge and he turn he just turns his bowl over he just flips it over so all the food falls out at once and it was just so flipping funny oh, well and- i saw crazier shit than that every day in the white house <laughs> i know i know everybody has a moment when they just were like what is going on with the president like one time he couldn't find his car right he gets off this is my daughter's favorite one he gets off air force one and directly in front of him is the car with the door open for him right the limo is right there but instead he gets to the bottom step <laughs> And he makes a right turn and he just starts heading out <laughs> onto the tarmac. Like, and then somebody had to go and like rally him back. Like a Marine had to pull him back in. That was, uh, yeah, that's Bama's favorite Trump story. There's just so many crazy stories. I mean, wasn't every day just ridiculous, like a circus? And none of them were purposely funny. He ha- His sense of humor is crude and it's about putting down other people like, he made fun of Steve Mnuch in one time we were sitting in the back of the East room and he was welcoming the, the temple. Now this is one of my favorite events. First of all, this was a horrible day. It was in the middle of fricking February. It's snowing out the wazoo. We go out to wait for him to land. We're standing in front of the oval. <clears throat> they tell us uh, he's uh, no, we're standing at the, at the uh, entrance to the residence and they're saying, no, he's going to go into the oval. So we all had to pick up. We had five minutes to pick up and turn around and run and reassemble ourselves in the exact same fashion. 50 yards away, it looked like something out of Fred Flintstone. It was like, you know, and we all turned around and it moved. And then I said, there's no way he's going to the Oval. The fuck, it's not even lit. So sure enough, it lands and he's bolting for the uh, East Room where the Temple football team is going to meet him. 
So now we're running and I being quick got there first. There was one camera on the backside. I said, do you still own the government shutdown, sir? And he goes, thanks for asking that tonight. We're going to be serving. And I go, wait a minute. I'm getting a fucking commercial for Chick-fil-A and McDonald's. Uh. What the hell? So and, and even even his press secretary, Sarah, looked at me like, what the fuck was that? And so he makes this commercial plea. He bolts into the East Room. We get into the East Room. The Temple football team is pissed off because, the, you know, they had shut down. There was during the government shutdown, so there was no food. So Trump had bought them all McDonald's and yeah. Chick-fil-A. And their guy's going, oh, our nutritionists are going to be really pissed. And the other guy goes, Jesus, what a cheap bastard. He got the six piece McNugget instead of the 10. <laughs> then he comes out and he's talking to all these people and he makes fun of Steve Mnuchin. He goes, Oh, this guy would never play. And he does it almost like Rodney, but in his own voice. And he goes, yeah. look at this guy. He'd never play football. And people are start laughing. And Mnuchin, who had those big Coke bottle glasses, kind of goes mmm, 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 like Myrtle the Turtle. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back. I'm laughing my ass off. I'm yeah. going, yeah. this is the most bizarre fucking 30 minutes of my life. By the way, when the helicopter landed, it blew snow all over us like it was. And I even wrote a column about that. It's on just ask the question. You can go back and read it. It was hilarious. I was landing and the light shining on us. He's laughing his ass off going. Oh, oh, yeah. the press. <laughs> They're getting buried in snow because all the snow got blown on us from the rotors. So it was just one of the most bizarre days I ever had in the White House in all the years I've covered. Yeah. OK, we got to wrap this up. But you had you had Anthony Scaramucci on your show, right? Is he a nice guy? What's his deal? Anthony's a pretty nice guy. <laughs> he just, he got caught up in the, I mean, he lasted 11 days and that. He was like, fuck this. <laughs> I mean, most people that uh, got shat through that goose were, were either did so voluntarily or because the president couldn't co-opt them. You know, it's like, all right, I, I see where this is going. I'm out. <laughs> Wait a minute. What is that saying? Shot through a goose. <laughs> yeah. You know, like shit through a goose. <laughs> well, all right. OK, I'm learning things left and right. Here. Shit through a goose. I'm telling you. <laughs> you crack me up. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really? Thanks for having <laughs> me. Anytime you need me, I'm here. Everything you're doing and and good luck when you go back to Ukraine. Really? You are the best. We need more people like you. I bless you. Thanks. <laughs> I'll take that as a positive. <laughs> hey, you guys, make sure you follow Brian over there on Twitter at Brian Karam and then follow me as well at Storyworthy. One more time on behalf of the very talented and interesting Brian Karam. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My name is Christine Blackburn saying make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Dad is the smartest guy you know, so give him a gift that's just as smart, like a battery-powered smart doorbell from Google Nest that lets him see what's happening at his door and answer it from anywhere. The Google Nest doorbell is now on special buy for only $129.99 and works on any home. Find the best and smartest gifts for Dad. Feels like Father's Day at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Offer valid through June 19th, 2022 at participating U.S. stores and online. Limit five per customer. Finding the right person for the job isn't easy. Just ask someone who hired a monster truck driver to deliver pizza. And the neighbors are going wild. You can hear that engine from a mile away, Fran. And he's foregoing the driveway and heading right up the lawn and over the azaleas. What a power move. But if you've got an insurance question, you can always count on your local GEICO agent. They can bundle your policies, which could save you hundreds. With six-foot tires and a roll cage, this pizza guy could quite literally crush the competition. For expert help with all your insurance needs, visit geico.com slash local today. Now let's take a short break so I can tell you about an awesome deal at McDonald's. 
Right now, you can get a crispy or spicy chicken sandwich for just $2 when you order ahead on the app. That's right. You get either one of your favorite chicken sandwiches for just $2. Valid one time per day through June 19th, 2022 at participating McDonald's. Excludes tax. Make D app download and registration required. At Progressive, we know there's nothing like the feeling of riding your motorcycle with your buddies on the open road. It's a potent cocktail of thrills, laughter, and pure adrenaline. A feeling that would be impossible to recreate on the radio. Until now. Hit it, sound effects guy. I'm real proud of you, son. Wow, that was terrible. Our apologies for even trying. Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.